Good evening, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is Michael Tanaka and I serve as the Daniel Inoue Policy Fellow for JCL National. To kick things off, uh, I want to take a few minutes just to share a bit about our motivations for this event, uh, how it came to be, and then I'll introduce our panelists uh, as well as our moderator for this discussion. Uh, so a few months ago, I had the great privilege of connecting with Kyoko Rhodes and her sister Irene around an upcoming film they are producing called Desolate Dreams, which is a short film set in 1942 Los Angeles and follows an African-American journalist who advocates for justice alongside a Japanese-American family that has been incarcerated following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The themes of this upcoming short film bring up many relevant discussion points that we felt should be turned into a real discussion, from uplifting a history of activism that continues between two communities around the actualization of reparative justice and reparations, to a broader conversation on solidarity within and across communities and issue bases against the forces that seek to divide, the ideologies that seek to hate, and the people that seek to erase history. Speaking of history, 102 years ago today, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, mobs of white residents armed by the city government killed hundreds of black residents and burned down more than 35 square blocks of one of the wealthiest black communities in the United States, totaling a loss of over $200 million today. When I think about advocating for black reparations locally and nationally, I think of the 1921 Tulsa massacre among the more than 100, hundreds of similar acts of racialized massacres of black communities, of black lives, and of black wealth from the end of the Civil War to the 1940s alone. Reparations is not a debate because reparations is not what is wanted, it is what is owed. Reparations is not what is desired, it is what is deserved. We are here today to open a conversation on defining allyship and solidarity across communities, not just between Japanese American and black communities, but all communities. And I encourage everyone present today to really lean introspectively into this discussion because there's so much to be discussed. Okay, so now to the introduction um, of our three wonderful panelists and our amazing moderator. So starting with Aura. Aura Sunada Newland is a fourth generation Wyomingite, fourth generation Japanese American, and executive director for the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. Her heritage involves intertwined stories of imprisonment at Heart Mountain and Tule Lake, segregated military service and hardships suffered by rail workers, railroaders who were fired because of their Japanese ancestry. Aura was elected to the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation's Board of Directors in 2013 and served as board secretary for eight years. She is also on the board of directors for the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts. She previously taught Asian American Studies courses at the University of Wyoming and was a tenured faculty member in sociology and anthropology at Wyoming's Northwest College. Aura earned a BA in ethnomusicology from the University of Wyoming and an MA in medical anthropology from Case Western Reserve University. Now focusing on the anthropology of law, she is a PhD candidate at Case Western Reserve University. And now moving on to Tracy. So Tracy Kato Kiriyama, is author of Navigating Without Instruments, based on unceded Tongva land in the South Bay of Los Angeles. She is an award-winning multi, inter, and transdisciplinary artist recognized for their work as a writer, performer, theater divisor, cultural producer, and community organizer. As a storyteller and artivist, they are grounded in collaborative process, collective self-determination, an art community as intrinsically tied in a critical means towards connection and healing. She is a performer and principal writer for the Pole Project Ensemble, two-time NET recipient, and NIFA 21 to 2022 finalist for their show, Tales of Clamor. 
They presented for over 25 years in hundreds of venues across North America as a writer, actor, poet, speaker, guest, lecturer, facilitator, artist in residence, and organizing arts and culture consultants that has come to appreciate a wildly hybrid career. And last of our panelists, we have Kathy. So Kathy Nishimoto Masaoka was born and raised in multicultural Boyle Heights, the Vietnam War and Asian American studies at University of California, Berkeley in the late 60s were important influences on her values. Since the 1970s, she has worked on youth, workers, and housing issues in Little Tokyo and Japanese American redress. Currently co-chair of the Nikkei for Civil Rights in Redress, she served, she served on the editorial team for the book NCRR, the grassroots struggle for Japanese American redress and reparations and helped to educate about the camps through the film curriculum stand up for justice and worked on the NCRR 9-11 committee to help build relationships with the American Muslim community through programs like break the fast and bridging communities. And now for the introduction of our amazing moderator Kilka Rhodes. So Emmy nominee and award-winning filmmaker Kyoka Kex Rhodes is a writer, producer, and director of films, commercials, and branded content for multi-screen platforms. She attended American University School of Communication in DC, earning a bachelor's degree in film and media arts with a minor in graphic design. She has produced and directed with networks such as the CW Network, Comcast Spotlight, BBC Studios, and online with 60 Second Docs. Her work has featured celebrities such as Denzel Washington, Maddie Moore, Don Cheadle, Joel Edgerton, and Ruth Nega. In addition, Rhodes has a background in public relations. At the American Bar Association, she issued press releases, produced videos, and photographed important personnel at ABA such events, such as the Supreme Court Justice and Congress, Congressman at the United States Capitol. In 2019, Rhodes received a regional Emmy nomination for a suicidal substance abuse prevention PSA campaign titled Be The One. She is the founder and creative director of Keck Studios, a full service production company specializing in film and video, branded content and graphic design. Recently, the screenplay of her upcoming short film, Desolate Dreams, was selected as a semi-finalist and among the top 50 of Cinequest screenwriting competition 2022 to 2023. While in development of her first feature film, she aims to continue using the art of film to tell stories with purpose and impact. So again, uh, thank you all for being here and I'll pass it to Kilka to get this started. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you all are joining us today. And thank you for being a part of this uh, webinar and thank you to our panelists. So. To kick things off, we're gonna be talking about centering our discussion on allyship. And in just a moment, we'll hear from the executive director of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, Ara Sunata Nolan. Uh, but before that, I just want to give some background about my upcoming short film project, Desolate Dreams. So the film was partially inspired by the events at Heart Mountain and highlights the theme of allyship and solidarity, particularly between the Black and Japanese American communities. And the reason why I decided to showcase these two cultures and communities coming together on screen is not only because personally I am half Japanese and half African American, but there is also shared solidarity between these cultures. And speaking of that, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation is gearing up for its pilgrimage this upcoming July, and will be honoring an African-American family named the Marshall family. So Ara, we would love to have you talk about the pilgrimage, uh, as well as who the Marshall family is and their significance. I did that thing where I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Kyoka, and it's great to see you. Um, and hello to everybody in the audience. I see a number of uh, names of friends on the participant list, so we're just thrilled to be here for this really important conversation. Um, 
Yeah, so it was at our Heart Mountain pilgrimage last year um, when I was sitting at a table with Marvin Inoue um, from Los Angeles, and he showed me this picture um, of a young Black woman holding um, a Japanese American child, and he said, this is a picture of my mom, and I was like, huh? You don't look Black. How's that your mom? And, and he went on to um, tell me the story of how he has always considered this woman uh, this black woman, um, his mother, he was sort of raised by her in his neighborhood. And that sort of started um, a thread of storytelling that is now becoming a major part of what we're working on at Heart Mountain. And I'm going to share my screen. Hold on here. All right. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So this uh, this is the photo that I was talking about. And uh, this young woman is Barbara Marshall Williams. Uh, the young girl that she's holding is Yoko um, Hoshizaki, the younger sister of Takashi Hoshizaki. Um, and what came out of this is an incredible story of cross-racial solidarity. Um, and it, it kind of starts with Barbara's grandparents. Uh, she's the descendant of a man named George Washington Albright, who was born enslaved in Mississippi uh, during Reconstruction. He became one of the first elected um, Black officials in the state of Mississippi, and then he and his family fled the Jim Crow South um, and eventually landed in Los Angeles in what's now Dayton Heights. Um, and it was just a homestead at the time. He kind of founded the neighborhood. And then the, the family was established there. And over the years, this is an area where a lot of Japanese immigrants started coming in. For those of you who are familiar with Los Angeles, you'll know uh, the name Jay Flats or Dayton Heights or Virgil Village area in East Hollywood. And it was a redlined area, meaning that um, these were areas that were restricted to people of color, really. Um, they could not move into the wealthier white neighborhoods. And so a lot of times, immigrant communities and Black communities ended up in the same neighborhood. Um, and so Barbara grew up, um, actually her, her mother, uh, Crystal Marshall, and her father, Rufus Marshall, uh, became really good friends with their Japanese American neighbors, and they shared food with each other, and they shared celebrations together, and they went to church together. Um, and it was this amazing neighborhood to grow up in, um, as Barbara tells it. And then when Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, the Marshall family stepped up in really every way that they knew how to. They looked after their neighbors' things. Um, they, they preserved things that people wanted them to save. Um, and beyond that, they, you know, took trips to go see their friends uh, who were mostly at Pomona. Um, and there's this story of Takashi Hoshizaki, um, a Heart Mountain draft resistor, ultimately, remembering being incarcerated at the Pomona Fairgrounds and having Barbara's mother bring him an apple pie with ice cream and passing it through the fence. Um, this continued sharing of, of food and friendship. Um, and then after the war, uh, when Japanese Americans came back to the neighborhood, the, the tradition of cross-racial friendship and allyship just continued with their children and the next generations. So these are uh, some post-war photos of, um, you know, Black and Japanese kids in the neighborhood being the best of friends. And um, I, you know, through Marvin Inoue, came to know this story and serendipitously ended up in Los Angeles um, in September and got to do some video interviews with uh, Barbara Marshall Williams and her family. This is her niece, Kiwi Birch. Um, and we are uh, currently developing an exhibit uh, showcasing these stories. And so this uh, photo on the right here is of Takashi and Barbara. They're both in their mid nineties um, coming back together really for the first time. And so um, at our pilgrimage this year, we are awarding the Marshall family our Compassionate Witness Award, which um, is recognizing uh, a person or a family who really stepped up to help Japanese Americans during the war um, who are outside of our community. And kicking off our pilgrimage, we will have this um, really spectacular um, exhibit called Making a Neighborhood, Exclusion and Community in J Flats, Los Angeles. 
Um, if you're not able to come to the pilgrimage or to Heart Mountain um, over the next uh, number of months while the exhibit is up, we have dreams of actually traveling it. So maybe it will be in Los Angeles um, and become a digital exhibit as well. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. And I'll turn it back over to Kyoka. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that, Ara, and talking about the Marshall family and sharing those visuals with us. And uh, continuing this conversation about allyship and solidarity, uh, we're going to be hearing from Kathy now. So Kathy, you have been involved in the civil rights activism for over 50 years. Can you share about the founding of NCRR? as well as Nikkei progressives being organizations rooted in the history of Little Tokyo, but even more so organizations rooted in intergenerational activism and solidarity across communities. Thank you, Kyoka. And uh, I also wanna thank Michael and both of you for organizing this um, webinar workshop on this topic. And uh, for Michael, for many of his, what, what he talked about really touched really touched home in terms of the Tulsa massacre and remembering that. Um, and thank you, Ara, for talking about uh, Jay Flats and the and the importance of sharing these stories and remembering them. And uh, and that is what we're trying to do. Is like the stories are the ones, and the history is what has really built solidarity. And just a word on J Flats is that actually I did grow up for a time, my high school years were spent living in J Flats. And I wanna give homage to uh, one of our founders of NCRR, uh, founding the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations was Jim Matsuoka. And he spent many of his formative years uh, after the war as a teenager and, and others other years in J Flats. And I think that really shaped him and one other member was Frank Emmy, a very key member of NCRR, who was a fellow uh, draft resistor of Ta Takashi, Takoshizaki, and uh, a J Flats uh, resident. So a lot of J Flats connections. So that story is really, really dear, dear to me too. Um, so yes, I think there's two things I want to talk about. One is the importance of learning from history, stories like this, and how important it is and key to building solidarity. And the other is the need to reflect and to think about how we understand solidarity as we learn this history. And to know that our understanding and of solidarity really changes and grows and I hope deepens you know, over time. Mine has had kind of a travel and so I wanted to explain that. So I grew, I was born and raised mostly in Boyle Heights, you know, which was multicultural. And uh, because of that, I think that was kind of an important beginning. And, Really, I came of age in the 60s at Berkeley, as was stated earlier. And I think I had nothing to do with these things. I was born in a certain place. I came of age at a certain time. And just luckily, I think it was a time when we were exposed to what was going on in the world. Vietnam War was going on. Uh, many peoples and countries were fighting colonialism and you know, taking back their self-determination and their countries. And I think that I, as a younger person at that time, and many of us were seeing the importance of third world solidarity. We're seeing the power. We're seeing the, the strength of, of people rising up. And we identified with that. And even though I didn't know my history, which was really the issue, was that we didn't know our history. We fought for ethnic studies. And we knew that it was somehow really key to whatever we were gonna do. It was important to our, our, our future, who we were, and, um, so third world solidarity and, and establishing ethnic studies is really important. And that idea of third world solidarity continued into our work in the community in Little Tokyo's. And so in Little Tokyo, it wasn't unusual for us to think about, even though we were centered in Little Tokyo, we knew that all other communities were really fighting for the same thing, to preserve, to self, to determine their own futures, to work with their different parts. Of, they saw the suffering that their community had gone through. And we, we linked that, we, we weren't separate. It wasn't like we saw our, our individual work as very separate. So when, you know, when uh, Native American, Indigenous people were demonstrating at the federal building, we heard you know, what was going on and it was kind of automatic for us to sort of wanna know what was going on. And, and that was when Wounded Knee was happening in 1973. And a delegation of Japanese Americans went there in 1973 
to help uh, bring awareness and to hopefully, you know, maybe protect in a way to be a presence at Wounded Knee uh, at the Pine Ridge Reservation. Many people don't know that history and we should really share that a little bit more. But I just, it's just to say, and not, you know, it's just to say that it was sort of within our framework. And so that kind of carried into the redress movement and the founding of NCRR and the work that we did. And so again, when the apartheid, anti-apartheid movement called upon people for support, it wasn't, it was kind of a natural response for our community to respond and to join and to support the anti-apartheid movement. And, um, you know, and in addition, when the Hopi Navajo called on for support because they were being moved off of their land and it was being contaminated by uranium, uh, I was really moved by the immediate response and overwhelming response of our community when we had a fundraiser at the Japan America Theater and it was filled. And I think our, our community and our, they inherently knew that there was a connection that, that we all sort of were tied together in terms of what we went through as people of color in this country. And so there was that response. And even when minorities in Japan came here to speak about what was happening to them in that country, again, there was an overflowing crowd of people that wanted to understand what their experiences were. So all this is to say is that I think even though we may not have theoretically understood uh, all the histories, all the stories, I think we knew in our hearts that we were linked together and that our histories were linked together somehow. But um, so um, I think more so though, these last few years, especially after the killing of George Floyd, I think that really opened my eyes and many of us that uh, to, the, to the deep anti-Blackness in this country and within our own community as well. And I think we had to examine ourselves and also look at what was going on and know that really that we hadn't been taught the history. We started to study. We saw that um, that uh, we saw that you know we needed to understand uh, the history of, of, of African Americans and of slavery and what that impact was in order to even support reparations. And so that a little bit of learning really opened our eyes. And and I know that I'm coming to the, probably the end of my time, but I wanted to make sure that even if you don't remember anything I said, I think the important thing is history and the California task forces report, 500 page report on the harms and the legacy of slavery are so important. It, it is like, you cannot deny that reparations is long overdue and, and certainly uh, something that Japanese Americans should support. Uh, and back to j Flash for one second. And that is that because I think of the grounding of our values in Little Tokyo, the Little Tokyo Service Center, which is the organization that builds affordable housing, is now building permanent supportive housing for families and for people in the J Flats area. And they did some history and some linking with the community respecting that long legacy of, of solidarity. So I'll end with that. Thank, thank you so much, Kathy. Such great points that you brought up. Uh, so now we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the art scene. Uh, as a filmmaker myself and an artist, I recognize how impactful the medium of film and art can be. And Tracy, you yourself are a multidisciplinary artist. You're a poet, storyteller, actor, writer, theater divisor. Can you talk about some of your art and work and how they connect with your role as an ally and advocate advocate for reparations? Sure. Thank you, Kiyoka. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, David and everyone um, for being here. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, you know, first off, just talk about how I, I see myself as an accomplice. Um, I uh, am always looking for chosen family in all the movements and the different work areas that we're engaging in. And so I feel like we continually find that because there's just so many good folks, you know, giving so generously of themselves for the greater good. Um, and I'm going to share my screen uh, and then hopefully through a very quick um, show of some slides. And I'm going to try to get to, to reading a little bit of writing. Um, that that's how I can sort of talk about why I think of myself as an accomplice um, and a partner in crime. 
And in, I think the big thing I think uh, about in terms of being an accomplice, uh, I think a lot about the process of constant learning and the process of building relationships for the long haul, because I, I see this as lifetime work. I see all of the things that we're doing as lifetime work. And so whether that is, uh, hopefully you can see the screen, yeah? Okay, let me move that up. Um, whether that is working within our super diverse and very um, varied multiple uh, communities as Asian Americans, um, I think I think a lot and, and work a lot on you know co-creating and supporting spaces. Um, this is Tuesday Night Project, and uh, we have what's called the Tuesday Night Cafe. And Kyoka, I really hope that you'll come out and and you know that we get to show your film someday. We really believe in sustaining over time uh, art and community space as a way for us to really dig in and, and learn from each other and talk about history, talk about memory, talk about our futures. Um, and this has been going on, we're in our 25th year. So we're super excited. Um, we hope you'll all join us. It's a free space. Um, and it's the longest running Asian American free public art series in the nation now. We're at 25 years. So, you know, it's, 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 it's odd and weird, but um, that's where we're at. And we, you know, always invite folks in. And it's where I learn a lot. It's where I learn a lot about different neighborhoods and communities and issues and, you know, things that people are fighting for. Um, I, you know, work very closely with Vigilant Love and so does Kathy. And I think we both feel very uh, honored and privileged um, to be a part of this space that's been growing between Muslim and Japanese American communities, especially right after 9-11 and uh, working with, you know, our Muslim and Japanese American youth um, in solidarity arts fellowships and, you know, just different ways of understanding critical issues happening right now. Um, so that's something that, you know, we always go, you know, to the annual pilgrimage to Manzanar. So that's our bus on the top left that you see. And, we, you know, invite people onto the bus every year. So I hope that, you know, folks will take us up on that. And I wanted to, you know, just extend a little bit of what Kathy was bringing up about Nikkei Progressives and uh, NCRR. Um, we really think that it's so critical for us to work uh, in solidarity and also in the capacity of an intergenerational mix of folks. We bring a lot of different perspectives and experiences um, by really allowing ourselves to, to convene. I, I'm like the Gen Xer middle person, um, and so is Tony Osumi. And then we have these amazing millennial folks and uh, you know Gen Z folks. And, um, and then we, of course, we have our like OGs, the, the Sanseis. And so again, another space where I learn a lot. I'm learning constantly, and we're constantly building relationships within and, and beyond. Um, in the work that we do. And what I wanted to say is we've been working with, um, we've been working very closely with both JCL and Sudu for Solidarity for the past few years uh, in our work specifically around black reparations. And uh, it's an, a work area that I think has brought us together in official capacities um, in ways that traditionally, historically our organizations haven't. And so then we created the National Nikkei Reparations Coalition, which everyone is invited to. Um, we're going to start meeting about every other month on the second Tuesdays, and you know, please reach out because we want to, you know, keep continuing to uh, study and show up for this work. Um, this is some of our some of our advisors, uh, Jason Heath and Kenneth Henry is not pictured here, but uh, I I see Jarrett Smith is on the call. He's also one of our uh, partners in crime and our, our our advisors. So just want to shout him out. And um, I want to just say that, you know, a lot of my work as an artist um, comes from this idea of the ways in which we bridge the past and the present as we work towards our futures. Um, and these are photos from the 1981 CWRIC hearings in Los Angeles. That was a major point um, on the path to redress in 1988. And so, um, actually, I, Kyoka, could you tell me how much time I have left? I want to see if, if I have time to, to read something. 
I think a couple of minutes. A couple mm-hmm. minutes. Okay. So I'll just say, you know, this, these ideas, all those, you know, spaces and people and these organizations and the movements that we're working in together continually inform me and affect me as an artist, as a theater artist. Um, these are some pictures of Tales of Clamor. And, you know, we, we're always thinking again about what is the real, what's the conversation between the past and the present? And how does it inform us now about what we can achieve and what, what, what we have a legacy of? A legacy of silence, yes, but also a legacy of speaking out. Um, so maybe I will leave it on these slides right here. And I'm just gonna read a little bit from, from my book. As a person who was not incarcerated, but as a child and grandchild of those incarcerated at Manzanar and Tule Lake, I learned when I was a kid that there was once a time before camp reunions and pilgrimages and monuments and former American concentration camps gaining the designation of national historic sites. Let us always remember the government did not give us any of it. We had to go out and excavate our own memories. We had to find our history and fight for the revelation of our narratives. They meant to lock up the camps and all evidence and have us go on without acknowledging the pain of our existence, without justice, without healing. That was not possible. Our Sansei generation had to find out who they were in order to move forward. And they uncovered history and they uncovered a reckoning. So this, you know, our, our history, um, our people, our fight, our legacies um, of showing up, of speaking out, of working in solidarity, of remembering that we couldn't win redress and reparations on our own. This informs everything that, that I am as a person, as an artist, as an accomplice. Um, so, you know, I'm really grateful for these kinds of spaces where people do want to show up and talk about it because I know everyone who joined today is, is, is active and, and, and in it. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thanks for reading part of your work. So we're gonna open the floor for a group discussion now, uh, Ara, Kathy, and Tracy, starting with how do we make sure that the story of Japanese American redress is not used, excuse me, is not used as a quote unquote, model minority narrative for reparations, but more so a testament to the realization of collective power. You know, I just wanted to, since I didn't get to include this part, and it's part of this um, answer, is that, as Tracy said, we didn't win redress by ourselves, and none of us are going to win anything by ourselves. Uh, and we all really have a stake in, in terms of allyship. I, I don't use that word too much because solidarity me means much more that we all have a stake in what's gonna happen, you know, in making injustice. So I wanted to say that we will not have won redress without the understanding of solidarity from the black community. And especially people like Congressman Mervyn Donnelly, Ron Dellums, Maxine Waters, Jesse Jackson, and the Congressional Black Caucus and all the other folks that open their doors and their hearts and their support for, for uh, reparations. And I think they knew they knew maybe we didn't understand so much as clearly as they did that this was really important to happen and it was important to happen for the future. And it wasn't just about us, Japanese Americans winning, you know, and I don't want to say we won reparations because my understanding now is so much bigger than 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 then, you know, it's like we want a token of uh, of, of redress. But uh, so I think they saw the bigger picture and now we're seeing the bigger picture. So I just want to put it that way in terms of of, uh, not being used as a model minority at all. Yeah, I mean, I think we, in in this discussion around model minority, um, you know, Susan Hayase out in San Jose with uh, Nikki Resisters always says that she sees the model minority not so much as myth or stereotype, but as a strategy, right? So it's it's a wedge, it's a it's a tool of being a wedge between our communities and even within Asian American Pacific Islander communities. So I think we have to keep addressing um, 
the the not just the nuances and the differences and the disaggregated information amongst our communities, that's all very, very important. And at the same time, I think we have to keep looking at the bigger picture, which includes so much history that that we don't know, you know, I, I, I took ethnic studies, I took Asian American studies, I mean, I thought I had a pretty good handle on like, our American history, you know, and, and, and the more I study, you know, from the guidance from so many other communities that we're working with, um, I've just realized how much I don't know, you know, and how much, and the thing is, I, I don't feel guilty. I understand that our, we're not meant to, <laughs> like, this is all very purposeful. Our lack of knowledge here right now is very pur pur purposeful. It's very deliberate, right? And so, and, and, and it's, it's, it feels like in some ways it's getting worse, right? Because people are trying to pull back and people already have pulled back and burnt books and gotten rid of uh, programs and education, right? And so um, just the fight for knowledge is so real. And it's, it's of, you know, hundreds of bills around the country that are trying to take away rights. A lot of it is the right to education, right? The, the right to knowledge and understanding of, of, of who we really are and, and how complicated and complex and how much we actually have worked together. Um, and how much we have fought too, you know, but how much we have worked together is never really talked about. Anyway. And I'll just um, add to the tail end of that. I, I'm so inspired by both Kathy and Tracy and, and by you, Kex, um, th with this theme that I feel coming out, uh, where all of us are here as like the experts on the panel, like we're the ones who know how to talk about this stuff. But I think what we're all emphasizing is that we are all on this process toward learning more and more. Um, like Tracy, you said, it's um, been intentional that we don't know our histories and we don't, you know, we don't know our own Japanese American histories and we certainly don't know the histories of other uh, disenfranchised groups. And so I think a way that we fight against these minority um, pressures is to engage deeply with each other's histories. Uh, we, we need to learn our own, but also, um, Put ourselves out there and learn each other's histories. Um, my background is in, in higher education, and I used to um, talk to my students about um, the need to put our skin in the game. And, you know, putting your skin in the game is, I, I actually looked it up, it's, it came from economics. Like, if you put your skin in the game, you invest some of your own money in something, like you take on some of your own risk in order to, you know, get some kind of a return. But the way I think of putting your skin in the game is in a in a racial solidarity sense, like I'm actually going to show up and and say, yes, I am a mixed race, white Japanese American woman. Uh, and I'm going to speak from that platform um, in order to engage with people um, who don't look like me and who have a different background from me uh, to put my skin in the game, to put race first and foremost, um, to engage with other people on topics of race. And that to me um, makes allyship or accompliceship, I love that word, Tracy, um, a little bit more tangible and accessible to those of us who are, who will always feel like we are, you know, on this learning path. Um, instead of saying like, well, the, the problem is just too much, too overwhelming to overcome, um, to just start off saying like, I'm gonna just jump in with both feet. I'm gonna fall on my face. I'm gonna make, you know, an awkward mess of myself and probably, you know, throw out some microaggressions while I'm at it. But if we don't do that, um, then we can't learn each other's histories and we can't uh, move ourselves toward uh, the healing that comes from reparations and all the other form of solidarity. Can I just say, I love that. Like I love, and I think that's so important, that idea of remembering that this is all an experiment, you know, <laughs> and, and we are constantly making mistakes. What, what I've written to myself even in the past, it, it's gonna constantly change my pledges, my sense of my duties, you know what I mean? My, my whys even, you know, like it continues to grow. So, that would be the worst thing if we're so afraid that we can't even talk to ourselves, our family and friends and with each other about our, our curiosities, our trepidations, our hopes, you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
So why is it important for Japanese Americans specifically to advocate on reparations and what is there left to do? So I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> well, it, I don't know, if, you know, specifically Japanese Americans, but certainly because we have an experience in building a movement uh, for reparations and as I said, winning a small measure of redress uh, that we again are not telling anybody how to do things. It was a different time, a different you know history, uh, or a different community. Uh, nor nor can we tell people what they should fight for. But you know, for what it's worth, I think that we do have some things that we felt were important about it in terms of people's voices, the grassroots aspect of building that. That's what we were building because that was what was going to continue, whether we want or not. You know, is that spirit of fighting for something. And uh, I think the fact that we did win does give some inspiration to people that we want something, you know, um, and we're reflecting on that, though. And I think so. Um, it's not one way. What I'm learning from reparations today is so it's really critical is that, well, if we want to avoid being the model minority, we didn't win because we were Japanese Americans. I mean, you know, and, and the camps certainly were not a mistake. You know, if we look at the history, it's like all of a long history of things that were happening to people of color. And we are just, you know, and so whatever we do, it's not going to stop things. You know, not, being good doesn't stop things, you know. So, uh, you know, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, in terms of some of the things we've learned is that the guarantees of, of non-repetition are really critical. And I think that's what sticks out in my mind so much is that, you know, you can pay people something, you can, you know, do this and that, but it's really those guarantees that it won't happen again. And how does that happen? It means that we all together have to deal with the structures, the systems that are in place, the laws that are in place, and do that together, you know, to guarantee that it never happens again. If we really mean that, Never again. It means never happening to anybody again. That's what we have to do. Yeah, and I think that the part of the never again is is the reckoning that we can't just go okay, clean slate from here, everyone. Right? We're, we're equal, equal rights. Right? It's like no, that's we have to talk about equity. We have to talk about wealth gaps. We have to talk about massacres. We have to talk about reckoning in order to get to repair. We can't just jump to reconciliation in my opinion. Um, and I think like, you know, I, I, I do think yes, um, in one way, we can't tell other people what they should do. However, <laughs> like I don't, for, for myself as a Nikkei, third generation, Los Angelino, queer artist activist, um, I, I, definitely don't think I'm going to try to tell everybody what they should be doing and working on. It's only specifically with the Japanese American community that I do feel I want to be on a tear about, come on, let's talk about this. Remember, people said it was impossible. Remember, people didn't trust us to make our own decisions on, on what it should be and how it should be done. You know what I mean? Like, let's remember all these things. And, and how do we just start from a point of like, don't like pause on the questions about implementation and just do a ton of study. That's what I think that a lot of us did. We just paused on any, well, how will it get done? And who's gonna pay like just pausing on implementation and really just investing and diving into study for months and months and then realizing, aha, the need for reckoning in order for repair, right? And one last thing I'll say is the Japanese American redress movement, right? Like it was over many, many years, right? Uh, the, repar the reparations movement now, the black reparations movement and also um, issues about land sovereignty for, for indig indigenous folks. I mean, these are decades and decades and decades and decades long. So at a certain point, aren't we not listening? And at a certain point, aren't we ignoring? So what does that mean for us to not ignore anymore and to pay attention and to just step up? 
And I guess I'll just add to that that maybe what we as Japanese Americans can contribute to these really important conversations about reparations, both for Black Americans and for Indigenous peoples, um, is to, um, I guess, communicate and, and show through our bodies and our experience um, how much it meant to us to get redress. Um, and not just the money, but to get um, our, our pain acknowledged um, and to get that apology and just to be able to, to step up for other groups and say, um, it, this is how much it meant to our community. And I think that other communities um, you know, deserve the same chance to be heard in this public arena and to be acknowledged and um, to at least you know, have a chance to to try for redress in the same way that we do. And I'll just um, also mention that HR 40, the bill um, that is being proposed to establish a study commission uh, for black reparations was put out there by John Conyers, Representative John Conyers, you know, decades ago, I think. And it was modeled after, after ours. Um, and so we can, you know, there, there are connecting lines that um, make it very clear that we we do have something to say here. It's not dictating what should be done or what reparations should look like, uh, but we can stand up and say this meant an awful lot to us um, in terms of our healing, and we want to support other people's chance to get that same um, type of healing. And, and I also want to just give this is a go on to say that it's kind of reparations continues. It's not a, a time limited thing. And so, you know, as we, and this may be my personal viewpoint, but from learning from what reparations can be in its full uh, full glory, you know, it's uh, it's like, you know, we, when we testified at the hearings in 1981, we said, oh, we want you to give back our communities. We want you to give back our EC, our first generation. We want you to, you know, we wanted all these things back. And then we ended with, we know that it's not possible. And now I want to say that from hearing what reparations can be, that we have to think about what really it is possible, that possibilities have expanded by what we have been learning about reparations. And I'm grateful, frankly, to the reparations movement today. So we may be advocating in support of reparations for African care, but I think we're advocating for all of ourselves too. Absolutely. So as we're wrapping things up, lastly, um, I'll ask, what is your why for committing to equity and anti-racism? And I'll briefly mention, um, I'll start by saying that for me, uh, being Hafu, uh, mixed race of Black and Japanese, I've experienced racism not only from non-minority groups, but also from both sides of Black and Asian communities. So for me, I think it's important to continue having these conversations uh, because racism is still out there. And I'll open the floor now for you all to share why you think uh, or why you are committed to equity and anti-racism. I have, I, I feel like um, Tracy and Kathy have um, some really profound things that I can add. So I'm going to actually start with a less profound one, but it also makes it accessible to folks who are, you know, watching or sitting there thinking like, oh, this, this topic of race is so difficult. And how do we even start? It's too overwhelming. Like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, there are all sorts of profound reasons like for humanity, why I do this and why we all need to. But there's also this selfish reason that it's fun. Like, it sounds all dark, like, let's talk about racism in America. But you know what? In, in my life experience, the, the greatest of joys come from having conversations about race with, you know, a group like this and uh, especially developing really close friendships with people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds from me. It fulfills me in a way that, um, you know, is almost indescribable, the kind of joy that I get from cross-racial work. And yes, it is uh, a topic that is devastating. And um, there's so much pain uh, that has always gone on and will continue to go on. Um, 
but there's also some joy and fulfillment um, and like pure elation that comes from doing this work. So um, if you're scared away from the dark side of it, then just do it selfishly because it's fun. <laughs> Um, it's, it's interesting that you keep using the word joy. You know, when I looked at the question earlier today, I just got a post-it note and I just wrote like, um, I don't think it's justice and joy. I just thought those are my two words when I think about my why. And I think like, it's just hitting me now. I'm, I, I, I kind of think it, I think justice and joy. I kind of think about my bachan, my Kiriyama bachan and my Kato grandpa. My, 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 my bachan, you know, she, she got to go get her check in person in DC and she was a hundred years old and she was so genki and positive always and called DC like the best city in the world after that and was just full, full of joy. And I got to see her joy and I get to experience that joy with every relationship that we build upon in the, in the, in this work. And I think justice, my grandpa died before the redress movement. He died in 78. And so that that's a bitter part for me. That's an angry part for me. That's the hard, dark part for me. But it drives my sense of like what 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 it means to not get justice. What that does to generations after. You know what I mean? So I think I think a lot about both and, and the, the relationship for them together. Kathy, do you have any thoughts with the remaining couple of minutes? I left? do, but, uh, and I, th I thank you both, R and Tracy, for reminding me about joy, because I think I've been feeling a little bit um, uh, the sadder part of, the, of looking at how things are. But, you know, it's, it's for me, it's like, it's not something you have a choice about in a way. It's like, this is what we, we have to do. And on one hand, I'm really grateful to be alive at this point in time to be where there are possibilities and where things are, people's eyes are opening up. And I know that we can't go backwards, you know? Uh, at the same time, I know that it's a lot of work and within our community, it's gonna be a lot of work and even, you know, and uh, it takes a lot of patience. And uh, I will try to keep in mind the joy of, of doing that work or, <laughs> and, but know that, you know, we, we will have uh, difficulty in, in t at times and so everybody here on this call, you know, that's what we're asking you all to do too, is to, to engage in those uh, conversations, to deal with our own anti-Blackness and ourselves and um, to build those relationships. Because yes, I do feel a lot of uh, happiness and joy when, when we build these relationships. And I know Kenneth Henry was on the call in Dresden and Kenneth calls us our Japanese, her Japanese American family. And that, that is, always feels really good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much to the three of you. This has been a very dynamic conversation. And I just want to thank the Japanese American Citizens League for partnering with me and Keck Studios to put this webinar on. And I'll go ahead and pass things over to Michael to conclude things. Yeah, thank you again, everyone. Um, I mean, again, thank you all for taking the time to come out to this event. Uh, thank you for our amazing, amazing panelists um, and, 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 and our moderator, Kyoka. Um, again, um, as discussed previously, you know, this discussion was meant to be a spark for our own introspective uh, reflection on solidarity uh, across communities um, within the diverse uh, experiences and histories um, that we heard today. Um, and so as a follow up uh, for this event, uh, more information about everyone, um, as well as the resources uh, posted in the chat, uh, I would be happy to email that out um, to all the uh, emails that did register. Um, and that being said, uh, given that it is almost uh, 6 p.m. on the East Coast, um, that, that concludes our event. Uh, so again, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming out, um, and, and we hope to do this again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. That's all.